Hey guys, welcome to Jerry's Live. As always, I'm your host, Amy Gardner-Dean. We are at episode 88 here, so for those of you playing along at home, you'll type in JL88 on the search bar on the jerrysartorama.com website. That will pull up all the colors we're using. Uh, if you see something that you just can't live without or you learn something and decide that you want to get some of the colors and try it, implement the idea and put it into good use. Uh, today we are doing Color Theory 101, basic tips, tricks, and I guess basic mixing, really. Um, now, this is something where the, we're starting this out. This is going to be a multi-part series, but we're gonna start it out very basic, but for those of you who already kind of have some knowledge of color, there's gonna be something we're gonna kind of discuss near the end that a lot of people actually don't seem to know about it that are even seasoned artists. Uh, so you may want to either, you know, if some of this is redundant, come back later once we're done and catch the end of it, just so you see what we were talking about and see if that's something new that you didn't know. Um, so just keep that in mind, you know, bear with me on that. Um, as we do this, because there are certain sections I wanna cover before we take questions, feel free to give the girls your questions uh, that are moderating, Amanda and Frida, and they will write those down and have them ready. Before, uh, when we get to a kind of a logical stopping point, the last thing that we cover, I will let you guys know, so you can go ahead and put the questions in, just because from us to you, there's there can be a bit of a lag sometimes of up to 30 seconds. So uh, just to make it go a little smoother, so, so we don't have to wait around and we're spending enough time on answering all of your questions. And again, like the Surfaces episode last week, I will go back and check questions on Facebook if there's something that the girls can't answer. All right, are we good? Everybody ready to go? Excited for color? No, I, I, I am. And, and, and then I realized I've dressed like Dieter from Sprockets. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked up at the monitor and I'm like, this is not what, okay. So it's so that the color's brighter, right? That's what we're going with. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, so Sir Isaac Newton is actually the founder of the color wheel, who knew? I guess you can deal with gravity and get bonked on the head and then you see colors and Smart develop a color wheel from there. But he realized with a prism that, uh, you know, how it threw light on a wall, he could see kind of what looked like a color wheel, started experimenting with it. He actually developed a color wheel in 1665. That's a long time to, uh, to have some color theory going on. Uh, and then it wasn't until the very early 1700s that he presented a paper, but then he, I did not know this and I thought it was very weird. Assigned musical notes to the colors because I don't know why and then everybody was like, that's great and it means nothing, which it didn't, but it was just. Is he one of those people that can like, I don't know. or whatever it is? I don't know. I think, I think maybe more than one apple bonked him on the head, but, <laughs> but the color wheel part's pretty awesome. So, um, so what, is color when you're seeing color what are you seeing really okay when you're seeing color you are seeing the light refracting off of the surface so if you're looking at red red is the color that's reflecting from the light everything else is being absorbed into that okay it seems like a really weird concept so it's like really is the item that who knows that's our perception of it so when you've got things that make pigments that refract that red, you're going to have it at multiple levels. So what we're breaking it down into for kind of the the basics of mixing and theory, we're going to use with this as we talk about the color wheel, because this is just our basic acrylic set and it says primary blue, primary red, primary yellow, and then there's a white and black. This is what I used. Now keep in mind that, you know, this is a value brand of acrylic there's nothing wrong with it. The pigment load is going to be lower than in something like the Charvin that I've got here. And that's why we have kind of, as we go through this color theory class, we're going to use the Charvin because it's gonna give us kind of a little bit more color punch. It's gonna be easier for you guys to see color. But for the sake of argument and for the sake of doing a very basic color wheel, I just used the basic Soho colors. So when you're talking color, 
primary colors, we've got this color wheel, and, and Katie will show this to us. We've got red, we've got yellow, we've got blue. Those are colors that you can't make. You can't mix up, you could mix up something that's a type of blue or that has blue in it. You can't make blue out of existing colors that, that you would have access to. So when they say primary, that means these three colors, all other colors come from, all right? So we've got them and they're spaced out in a very particular way. This is where they're going to need to stay on this color wheel. So we've got that. Then with our second overlay, we've got our secondary colors, all right? Push it up just a tad. Oh, doo, doo, doo. That, that's as far as I can get it pushed no, that's perfect. All right, cool. All right, so we've got our secondary colors here. We'll cover primary so nobody's confused. All right, so what you've got in between your primaries, which are here, are your secondaries. That means if I'm mixing the red and yellow, obviously I'm getting orange. If I'm mixing the yellow and the blue, obviously I'm getting green. Mixing the blue and the red, I'm getting a violet, okay? So secondary colors means that even parts of those primaries are going to make that specific secondary. And it gets crazier. I didn't get a rise out of Frida. She's like, color schmuller. I know. I'm answering questions. I know, you're, you're being a boss, I can tell. All right, so after our secondaries, to make our color wheel complete, We've got our tertiaries, okay? So our primaries still here. We've got our red, blue, and yellow, okay? Then we've got our secondaries, which we've got the orange, we've got the green, we've got the violet, or violet, excuse me, right there. Now in between those are our tertiaries. So when we've got our red and we've got our orange, we've got this intermediate, that is red, orange. Now this is something that seems confusing to people, but if you think of it this way, always think that you lead with the primary color when you're naming it. Okay, so this wouldn't be an orange red, this would be a red orange that's in between the red and the orange. So equal parts of those are going to make your red orange. Then we've got the color in between the orange and the yellow, which is our primary, yellow. So that's going to be called yellow orange. Then we've got our yellow green in between the yellow and the green. Then we've got our um, we've got our blue. We've got our blue green here. I, it, it's there's a reflection for me <laughs> on the lights because it's shiny acrylic and it's like all these I can see really really easily. The darks because I've got that weird thing with my eye where one sees grays and then one sees color. I'm like this all just looks like the same value to me and it's hard for me to pick the colors out. All right, so we've got the blue and the green make a blue green. Then we've got our violet, blue and violet make blue violet, violet and red, they make a red violet, okay? Does that make sense so far? So we've got our color wheel. We've got those primaries that we saw at the beginning, right? So very slippery. So we've got the primaries at the beginning, we've got those secondaries, and then we've got the tertiaries on from that. Now, when we talk about color and we talk about color theory, you can use color to speak through your work, to give it emotion. You can use color to, um, if you're doing an outdoor scene, to make it look cool and wintry, you can use color to make something, you know, make a very sun-baked beach if you're doing a landscape. Uh, portraits, something that's in warm colors, maybe looks more vital, more lifelike. Maybe you really tweak those colors and make them more saturated. It looks more angry. So let's look here then at how do we know what are warm and cool colors? Sometimes people are confused. So if we put this overlay on, let's get rid of our primary tertiary and secondary so that you can see the thing here. Now when we put that on, we've got that natural split between, all right? 
So all of our colors here are considered cool colors. Red, violet, or red, violet, violet. We've got blue, violet, blue, green, and then, um, or blue, green, and then the green. Cool colors, serenity, calm, coolness, or cold even, growth, water, night, all of those colors can be used to kind of represent those types of things to give it kind of, even in shadows, consider that if you've got a lit subject, shadows are a lot of times more successful as cool colors than warm colors because it get, shadow is usually a cooler spot, okay? So you've got your warm colors, energy, warmth or heat, brightness, action, movement. Uh, you can take that a step further. That can be anger, right? If you're doing a portrait, you're trying to say something, a mob scene would be much more exciting and look really angry if it was done in warm colors than if you did it in blues, okay? That might seem like something depressing or cold or somber, all right? So that's our color wheel. We've got that. I will keep this out in case anybody has questions. We can come back to that. And let's look at, uh, we're gonna take questions in just a minute, Frida. Um, in fact, let's take, we'll, we'll talk about um, hue real quick, and then we'll take some questions before we move on to color schemes, all right? So be ready with questions. All right. Let's do this to make this easier. Okay. So these are technical words that people have heard that they might not know what it means. So we're just going to break this down into kind of basically just the explanation of what the word is. Hue. A lot of people are like, I'm not kind of sure what that means. Does it mean something bright? Does it mean something kind of dark or colors added in? Hue means the absolute pure color, okay? Your color right out of the tube. All right, so I took those primaries. We've got our blue, red, and our yellow. That is the hue of those colors. Slide it up. There we go, okay. All right, then we are going to the shade of those. Now, when I did this, I was going to mix equal parts because these are kind of more your value stuff. The black had a lot of punch. So I had to actually put more color in. This isn't half and half. This is actually more like two thirds hue and then black. So a shade means that you're adding black to your hue, all right? So this is the blue in that, this is the red, and this is the yellow. That almost looks like an olive green. Okay, they're very dark, but that is a good way to be able to use a color in a shadow without something being a pure black. Think of shading for shadows, all right? You can just darken that hue. All right, then we're going with a tint. A tint means you are adding white to that hue, okay? You can make it almost so light with that hue that you can barely see it when you tint it, you know, where it's just almost like a very lightly blue white, or you can make it something more in between. This is about what would be considered a 50% value, which the next show will talk about values. But this is our tint of each of those hues. The yellow is actually very strong in this. I was surprised. All right, then we've got tone. Tone means that with that hue, you're adding gray to it. Gray is an equal amount of white and black. I added to it and then added to the hue. These look like those shades of gray colors, don't they? Okay, so that's, that's our blue, our red, and our yellow. You can see you can make almost a violet with the red and gray and almost like kind of a reddish violet and then almost an olive green with that yellow. All right, okay, questions. Do we have any so far? I, I think most of mine will probably come after the color mixing segment. Okay. Because they're mostly in regards to that. To the, we're gonna, I'm not sure how far into the, why don't you ask those um, now? Because I'm not sure how far into that we're going to. They want to know, to... A, what colors are good for shadows. 
B, what colors can be used to make black? And C, what do you mix to get different shades of turquoise? Okay. Um, we're going to talk about the colors a little later, and we're going to talk about learning how to kind of decipher when you look at a color, it's not just a lemon yellow, there's a pigment number assigned to it. We're going to talk about learning how to decipher what that means and what that means to you color wise for how to mix that. So the turquoise, that's going to be something that we'll be getting to with some of these other uh, classes that we do because that's going to be some blues, some greens, maybe a little bit of white. And it all depends on what color because turquoise is just a name that doesn't mean anything as, as far as in the, the realm of things. Now to make shadows, it depends on what you're painting. It depends on, are you wanting this to be as realistic as possible to look, you know, trompe l'oeil where it's just like the picture? Or are you, you know, trying to give a mood or evoke something, you know, deeper to it? Obviously with these shades, you can take any of the colors that you work in as a hue, darken them down with black and give yourself a nice color uh, that can work very well for shadows. And it's really going to depend, we're going to talk in the next episode about value. We're going to talk about what does value mean when you're dealing with color. That's going to also dictate with that shadow, not only, you know, you don't want it to be a black outline. You want it to kind of have a value in there where it's going to look realistic as a shadow rather than just a big sharpie outline. So you, we're going to talk about value in that next series as well. Now, if you don't want to use black, how you make black, where it looks very, you know, it reads to the eye like black. So you can do one of two things. We've discussed before on a show uh, where we did, I guess the was the first show of last year, wasn't it, Katie? Where we did the watercolor gouache and we talked about how to make a chromatic black, uh, which the best way to do that is get two colors that are opposites on the color wheel red and green are the best it's really good to pay attention to pigment number when you do that because a natural red uh like a, a pigment red 101 which is could be an english oxide or english red it could be a red iron oxide something like that that's more of a natural red and then something like kind of a darker green not dark like deep olive green but something that's not it doesn't have a lot of yellow in it that's a nice medium green a lot of times will make a relatively passable chromatic black when i'm painting what i use are dioxazine violet and burnt umber or a deep ultramarine and burnt umber those are my go-to's for making something that's a black nobody can tell the difference but a lot of times i can just use pure dioxazine if i can make it dark enough it's not a glaze because it's not an opaque color and the same with the blue. Prussian blue, sometimes I also will fudge in there as black because Prussian blue, typically, depending on the manufacturer, is a blue pigment and also a black pigment, depending, okay? All right, is there anything else or can yeah. we move on to the next? So Amy asks, as artists, we don't often use numbers to describe colors. Is this a term that's usually used in graphic design? No, this is not. These are going to be your actual pigment numbers. When you've got a tube of paint, there is a pigment that this is. You hope it's a single pigment because that's going to give you the cleanest color mixing, which we'll talk about that at the end. But this is a cadmium lemon yellow. So it should be, the sticker's off, but it should be PY35. Okay, that is the pigment number for cadmium. PY means pigment yellow, and 35 is the number for it. It's the scientific name. Is this, yeah. It's well, it's it's, it's, call sign? it's it's basically the the reference number, yes. if you will. Like, remember the old Dewey Decimal System? Yeah. Some of you won't because you're too young and don't need to know that. But but it's it's like the the catalog number for pigments and how they're made. So you need to know what it is because if this says cadmium lemon yellow hue, this could be three different pigments, none of which are that yellow. So it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to make this yellow out of that hue okay and this is something that's that the more you paint the more important it is to know the more successful you're going to be with color uh, there is a website called artiscreation.com www make it one big word but it's artiscreation.com that you can take your tubes of paint at home look it's generally printed on the tube you can go to that website there will be 
color sections that have all the numbers. You can go to PY35, click on it. It will tell you all about what it is. It generally has the manufacturers that use that pigment name and what their brand name may be for it. Um, it will have, if it's toxic or not, it will have light fastness ratings generally overall for the pigment. Different manufacturers and whether it's oil, acrylic, or watercolor may change how light fast it is depending on kind of what the vehicle is for the pigment. But it will give you all sorts of stuff. It will give you if it's um, got issues like some paints and oils can't be used together. So pigments, you know, lead is very volatile with things that are sulfur based. So it, it will give you information to help you better understand what materials you already may have in your hand, what you probably already do have all these materials in your hand. And this may be the first time anybody's pointed out that this is extra knowledge that's already there at your fingertips that you just weren't aware of and did not know how to access, okay? It's also good if you have any kind of allergies or sensitivities or... Yes, most definitely, especially if you're working with dry pigments, uh, like in pastels. I don't think it's as probably as important unless you're gonna spray it for other stuff, but it may be important you know, like wear gloves if you've got metals allergies and you're working with paint and you're very messy and you tend to get paint on you. Other questions before we move on, ladies? Okay. All right. So let's pull this warm and cool colors off. Take that on. <coughs> Set that over here. All right. So when you're working in color, there's things that are called uh color schemes all right and maybe you've heard of them and maybe you haven't uh what what does that mean it doesn't mean that you're just necessarily taking the painting and painting whatever the colors actually look like you may be doing some of that but you may be tweaking it in a certain way and adding some specific colors to give it a certain emotional feel all right um the first thing let me get the overlays that do this so many things hidden everywhere. <laughs> and I feel like we should be dancing like sprockets. All right. All right. So complementary color scheme. It's the most basic. It's one you guys see pretty much every day. We just got done with a holiday that's totally based on it. Complementary color scheme is what? Bit. All right. Is that good? Oh, let's put this back under it so the shine's not. It's Christmas. Yes, it is Christmas. <laughs> Christmas is the biggest in your face complimentary color scheme that's out there. No, does that mean that you take a painting and you only paint in red and yellow? Or I mean, excuse me, red and green? No, 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 that, that does not mean that. That means that you're using colors that are in kind of that red and green range. You may be taking and toning them down with gray you may be tinting them to make them lighter you're not necessarily using them i mean you can use them straight out of the out of the tube that is very in your face right so that makes the most sense as far as using kind of christmas as an example now i mean you can take this and you can turn it another hugely popular one blue and orange that's actually the strongest of all of them that's less in your face than that red and green Okay, blue and orange together tend to both soothe and kind of enliven with the energy from the orange. Then you've got violet and yellow are very popular. But I mean, you can take it and you can make them so that it's tertiary colors that are your complements. As long as it's across that actual color wheel, that is its actual complement. All right, uh, an example of this. So we're gonna have to I'm gonna put it right here all right some of you guys saw this painting on the show that that I did it was very large that's why I did not bring it in it's on the wall of my studio waiting to finish kind of the hands and the face this is actually a complimentary color scheme too far hmm too far I fixed it. I oh too okay far. all right um, it's very deep blue I used Prussian blue and then a phthalo blue underneath I actually, when I went in to go in to do the face, I did some glazing with oranges first, then built the colors out for that. So although it's not orange, it's not like 
totally obvious that that's what's going on. Another artist that's big into color schemes probably could pick it up. Um, the gold kind of echoes that a little bit because it's a little bit kind of a yellowy orange, but most people wouldn't. It gives it some energy and some warmth and makes her more lifelike because of that orange, but the blue is a much more calming, soothing, and it gives it a little bit more it's not a piece that denotes power, but that blue and orange together kind of gives it some, if that makes any sense, okay? So that's an example of a complementary color scheme and how it doesn't need to be right there, you know, in your face color. It can be muted down, but it's working psychologically to give kind of a, a, a feel, all right? So that was complimentary. Let's move on to the next one. I feel like I should save these in case we need them again. All right. Next is a split complimentary color scheme. All right. What that means is if I wanted to do, uh, let's say violet, a split complimentary of the violet there would be a yellow green and a yellow orange, okay? And spin it around, maybe I should spin it around so you can actually see the text on it. Oh, the color wheel, it's making you dizzy. All right, so blue, a, um, the straight green, and then a red orange would be a complementary color scheme. All right, now on this wheel, because the, it's all bright hues, it's very, bright and in your face and jarring. A split complementary color scheme, I think is actually probably the color scheme that I work the absolute most in with work. Um, let's see. This is based on two color schemes, but I'm gonna show the, the split to it. Okay, everybody's seen the cows, right? So we've got two split complementaries that are working here. We've got the orange and the blues, okay? So we have kind of a little bit of a brighter blue and kind of more a darker violety blue. And then we've got yellow and violet where we've got more of a yellow orange and a kind of almost, this lemon is almost bordering on kind of being greeny. You can see a little bit of kind of that yellow green up in there. Can everybody see that? So it's, it's based on those, but again, you're not making it where every color has to be one of those three colors. You're using it to provide some balance and some energy to a painting. All right. Okay. Next up analogous color scheme. This is another very popular one that a lot of people don't know about, but I like to use because I like what this looks like. An analogous color scheme, you're taking three to four colors alongside that each other in the color wheel. I tend to incorporate four because I think three together is just a little limiting. Um, I'll actually kind of punch it and use four. I might even kind of delve into a fifth, but it's generally four. All right, what this is doing is when you're using it, you're not using, again, all as a bright hue. One color of these is going to dominate, and then the others are going to play supporting roles in varying percentages, okay? Doesn't have to be a cut and dry percentage. You don't want these all to be very strong because it's just too much, unless you're wanting your work to be emotionally overpowering to the viewer if you're wanting it to be, especially if you were gonna use reds. I've done a couple paintings in red. Um, remember the one, they've not seen it because there's a nude in it, but the one with the fire, kind of the fire background and everything, where it's very, very bright. It's very uncomfortable, isn't it? It's very in your face, totally the reds analogously in it. Um, and and the, it's supposed to be painted that way for a reason. All right, so analogous color scheme. I brought two, and they're ones we've done on the show. Grumpy Owl is an analogous color Grumpy scheme. Owl. I just want him. Okay, he fell in my studio, and now the paper's icky. Oh no! All right, so 
if we look at this, we would be taking this analogous color scheme and we'd be doing this, right? We've got that little bit of red orange. We've got some orange in there, kind of with our, with our burnt sienna provides the orange. We've got yellow and then we've got that yellow green, right? Perfect example of an analogous color scheme. Grumpy owl. And an adorable little bird. Yes, very grumpy. All right, the other one, which maybe there's something in owls in analogous color schemes, I don't know. Analogous color scheme, right? Now, you can see that some of them are softened and they're made into tints, so it's lighter, but then you can see some of the pops, right? Oh, no, He's Brina's all favorite. excited. I love him. So, see what I mean about that there's one that kind of plays more of a dominant role, like the green did in the Grumpy Owl, the yellow green? They're making owl faces. Woo. All I'm saying is he would look real cute in my room. <laughs> uh, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is I do not like using the, the um, it's not glass and it's already gotten Plexi. like scrapey. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. Probably. His eye has like a big yeah, scrape across it. it. <laughs> all right, so another version of an analogous color scheme and kind of how that works. That's that obviously grumpy owl looks grumpy with those other colors that are kind of hotter. He looks very soft and... Be sleepy. Kind of, yes, sleepy and very sweet, like he wouldn't try to rip your finger off if you tried to pet him. All right. So then, switch it out to a triadic color scheme. Now I've got two on here, so we're going to do, because it was my last piece of stuff. All right. Triadic color scheme is three evenly spaced colors. Go back, how we talked at the beginning, your primaries are a triadic color scheme. Your secondaries are also a triadic color scheme. Tilt those little three dials there. Any of those other ones, if they're equally separated like that, could be your triadic color scheme. Now, red, blue, and yellow, that sounds like it would be like in your face and look like a kid's toy. Okay, this is a triadic color scheme. Can you see the blue, yellow, and red in it? Would you normally think that that was those three bright? It, you don't read it as that, right? right. But it's how. It's not daycare. Right, but it's how this can kind of what the, what a triadic color scheme is supposed to do is it's supposed to give you harmony yet contrast simultaneously. I think that that actually does that. That's a good example of that. Okay. My mind works in mysterious ways when I'm painting. I didn't realize it was. I was looking around the studio going, oh, look, there's that. Oh, there's that. Well, it, this is one of those things that once you learn it, it kind of... It gets stuck in your head. You're not getting you rid of it. And you do it without realizing it, yeah. Yep. Because, it, and when you're in school, in a painting class, you specifically have assignments where they're like, and so you're gonna go to the biology department and get an animal and it's gonna be a split complementary color scheme go. And you're like, w what? <laughs> that makes no sense. It's a way that you're, you, you're doing a subject that you don't get um, attached to, right? Because who wants to paint a fox or something in a split complementary color scheme? But it's a way to reinforce and stick that color scheme into your head by making you have to be creatively paint something with that color scheme that you can't, like, right off the top of your head identify, if that makes any sense. All right, tetradic color scheme. Let me look at my thing that we're gonna show and see if I can figure out how to, okay. So, it's kind of tilted here. Tetradic color scheme are double, using double complementary colors in a work, which sounds crazy. And I thought when I was writing this, I was like, uh, psh, nobody does that. Yeah. Did you do it? Yeah. <laughs> I looked at the wall, I was like, oh. Uh, so <laughs> what this is doing let me find what the actual term was for it because I, la I laughed when I read it and I was like, oh, okay. It's the most varied. You're using those two complementary color pairs. This can be hard to harmonize, right? Because that's a lot going on. You got four colors like in your face going on. You're going to want to choose one and give pops 
of, of dominant color in other places. I actually feel like I maybe pushed it a little. There's one color that's obviously very dominant, right? It, it's, it is, and I was like, oh, okay. All right, obviously orange and blue, right? Are our two big ones there. And then we've got the violet and the yellow, correct? But then it's like got one more. What does it have? Little pops of green and red in there, too. So I like went even a step further, but I actually very specifically played on that color scheme to have the balance of the, the little guy in back is named Charlie of him being very um, cool colors because he's in the background. So that drops him back, right? This is where we're talking about that color temperature, but I actually chose to make his collar red. It's not to then bring that eye forward and find goofy Dodo Waldo here in the hot colors um, with the orange and the yellow there. But you can see little pops of violet in different places, right? See how the shadows, when they were talking about shadows and color, what that can do. Notice how in there, it's these little kind of violet and pinks that actually help that to drop away. Not what you would normally think, right? It's not black, it's not gray. It's, a, it's still nice warm colors, but it gives that shadow where it becomes, the color isn't as saturated as up here, it becomes more muted as it falls away to read as shadow. All right, does that make sense? It's so cute. Plus it's just crazy bright. All right. Crazy colors capture the insanity of pointers. Because they're insane. All right. So, do we have any questions after that with the color schemes, ladies? I'm guessing we do, because Frida's madly writing. So, the first question, um, when you're using analogous colors, mm -hmm. um, do you just want to use only those three colors, or can you mix those three colors to get a larger range of colors in order for it to still be analogous? It's still, it's still considered analogous because those are your main colors. The analogous would be like if we're looking at the reds there, right? That's, you can mix those all day long into each other, right? It's when you go over here and you're suddenly adding a green or, uh, you know, a blue or something like that, that then you've, for that color theme, it's not like you can't have a little bit in a shadow here or there, but if you're really starting to use a lot of it, you've gone off the reservation and then you're really more going into that split complementary where you'd have the blue going over into the hot colors, okay? So analogous just means you're sticking to kind of one area, one side, you can mixy mix and mix and match all you want. And it's still considering that because it's that chopped off range of color, whether it's like this or this, chopped off range of color that's giving you that kind of color theme, if that makes sense. The next question was, when you're doing analogous colors, can you have a darker version of a color so like dark green green yellow and orange yes it's 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 okay when i think this is it, and it's confusing because this is all very new and weird okay when you've got those you can still go back to this these are our three colors but look this color by adding other things becomes different colors that's still t forms of yellow right these are still forms of red these are still forms of blue. So it's still considered if you're using a specific color scheme, but you're using black, you're using white, you're using gray for it, you're still sticking to that color scheme, you're just, you're just toning it down. Just like in that picture of the pointer in the shadows for him, it was still kind of those hot colors, but it was using tones to take some of the heat and saturation out of it. When you're picking these color schemes, it doesn't have to be this full hue, full color pop, because that's not out in real life reality, okay, if that makes sense. You can, you can tint them, you can shade them, you can tone them, you can do whatever you need to to uh, basically make that color fit your will. Amanda. Um, would there be any really bad ideas for color combinations or 
with the right touch, you could make anything work. Um, the thing is, if you really start, you know, this, this is just, when you're doing these, this is the majority of the colors you're working with kind of fall in those. Obviously the cow was a little loose outside those edges, right? But the problem is when you go into it and you're using all the colors, everything, depending on what it is, if you don't have some sort of underlying scheme that kind of helps mold the image, it can start messing with your composition. Color is a very powerful thing, and especially the more of just straight up hue you use, where you're not toning it down in one way, shape, or form, whether it's a tone, a tint, or a shade, can lead the eye different places without you realizing it, and it can make a painting that's supposed to be saying something, it's supposed to have a lot of movement in it, and a lot of expression, either become where the person keeps looking off, or it can become very unsuccessful in that it just starts bottoming out and looking very flat and plain because it's so much of everything, the viewer just gets overwhelmed mentally. I mean, they might not know why they don't like it, but they don't like it, okay? If that, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a hard, it's hard to explain, but it's, if you've ever looked at somebody's work and you're like, like, I, I'm gonna straight up say, I do not like Renoir. Hate it, don't like the dabbing. It looks like somebody frosted something. It's not that I don't appreciate it. The people all look the same too to me. Part of it is that uh, to me, that dude just couldn't pick a dang color scheme. And it's so much color and so much everything. And then so much those pattern brush strokes, that's where that gets you in trouble. You don't have a straight up scheme to go with. And then you're doing this like little itchy, squishy, squashy patterning. It just becomes so much that I'm just like, dude, I'm, I'm out of here. I don't want to look at your stuff. But that's what that's that, what you're going for. But that's what that does to me, which, yeah, that's fine. If you don't want people, you know, obviously it didn't hurt him. But to me, he was one of the least successful of the Impressionist painters because of that, because he did not have very mature kind of color instincts and he didn't follow them. Any other questions? I have some for later. Okay. All right. So now we are going to take this and we're going to move all this out of the way. And we're going to get into um, color temperature mixing and talk some about pigments when we do this and what, what this all really means. Okay. Now, for this, these colors that we just looked at with our color wheel, I used the that Soho set, right? So one yellow, one red, one blue. Boom, there you go. When you looked at the wheel, did the violet really stand out to you and read as violet? To me, no. To me, those weren't great primary colors and that's not, having three colors and limiting yourself to three mixing colors is not going to help you in your kind of advancement of color because they're kind of middle of the road. They don't stand out one way or the other. They're not a warm temperature or a cool temperature of that color. And therefore that's going to kind of limit your progression with mixing. All right. Now we've talked about this in, in some of the episodes in that one episode last year, we talked about it with the gouache because remember when, when I talked with Jimmy, he'd said the kind of warm and cool colors. So we've got a bunch of Charvin colors right up there. We're going to very quickly look at these. First, we'll look at these colors because they're nice and bright. Now, magenta is a color that some people use for mixing. Now, we've got two red-based colors, a uh, PR-122 and then a PR-176, or excuse me, 146. They look very different. This looks very, what, violety? Mm -hmm. Does that not look like a very violety red? So what is that gonna be? Is that gonna be a cooler or a warmer red? If that goes back to, let's get the color thing out and keep this here. So we've got our cool and warm, right? So if we've got this and it's more of a violety red, it's pushing this way, right? It's pushing into those cool colors, correct? All right, 
So where by contrast, this other primary magenta is a lot closer to red, correct? It's not like getting over here into more of the oranges, so it's not as hot. It's just a good kind of medium red primary and it's magenta. This would make a good basic mixing red like the Soho red because for all practical purposes, if you're making oranges, if you're making um, some red violets and stuff where you're kind of lightening a violet, this is going to work reasonably okay, right? If I wanted to make a really nice violet, would I use this one or would I use this one? I'm gonna pull a brighter color swatch of both of these out because I think that this is gonna make it so that it's easier for people to understand. As they've dried, it looks kind of gloppy. And keep in mind that there's a slight color shift with most acrylics. The ones who say there isn't are kind of full of garbage, so. <laughs> what? I mean, don't you think, Katie? Yeah, yeah. Okay, see how, vi how violet-y that is? You can really see the violet in there, right? Or the tendencies. There's not a violet, there's no PV, so it's not a pigment violet, right? Big difference between the two and there. Do we need to angle this a little bit, you think, with that? I can see it's it got some good. sheen to it. No, you can definitely see it. That's a little better. Okay. Yeah. All right. So good average basic red. This would be better for mixing uh, with your violets or to make a violet, right? Taking a blue with that would definitely get you a very nice violet. This might be that kind of this reddish color that really, to me, because of my weird color thing with my eyes, looks like a burnt sienna. Okay, so then we've got the cadmium red deep. PR 108, so it's pigment red 108, which is a cadmium color. This is where this falls on that, I'm doing this so you guys can see what I mean by temperature. See, that's more orange than this. This is still a little on the cooler reds. This is definitely warmer. Is it going through with you guys' monitors pretty good? Yeah, Katie? it's here. Okay. All right, then we've got, lovely, okay, good. Then we've got a cadmium red scarlet. This is PR 108. This is where I'm asking you guys to look at your colors and take your colors out and actually do this and evaluate them. PR 108, PR 108. This is a different treatment of that. Look at how much more orange that is. Is that not a lot more orange? Those are the exact same pigment. This is called Red Deep, this is called Red Scarlet. They're the same pigment, but due to the treatment of them when they're actually manufacturing that pigment, this definitely is more orange of a red, right? So if you're going to be using it with yellows to create more of a nice orange, this would be the one that you would want to use because that's already gonna be bumping kind of that orange color. Is it coming up? It's gonna be weird on different, different no, no, people's no, monitors are gonna read differently. Make sure we type that correctly. Okay. The blues get a little ishy. Yes. Ishy, yes. All right. Now, cadmium yellow, or cadmium orange, that's the PO20. And then cadmium yellow deep. That's a very nice orange right there. That's bright. That is very bright. Now, this to me can read as an orange. That's almost like a sunflower yellow, but look how when you spread it out in mass tone like that, the hue of that color is almost more orange, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna want to use it for mixing with reds, this is gonna be your guy because it's a very hot, hot yellow, right? The more lemony a yellow gets, the and towards a green, kind of a green undertone, the more cool it is, and that's when you're gonna wanna mix that with your greens. All right, so this is their French primary yellow. It's a PY74. There's this, then this is a cadmium yellow. It should be, I can't read the sticker. I can't, my nails are not. <clears throat> I think it's 
PY35. Then this is our lemon yellow, which is the PY74, same as their primary yellow. Okay, so let's see what looks different with that same pigment. Same company, one's calling it a French primary yellow, one is calling it a lemon yellow. Same pigment, right? Okay, that is a nice kind of mid, uh, middle of the road yellow. This is the cadmium lemon. That's starting to get a little greener, but still it could kind of work. This, the cadmium lemon yellow is slightly greener than this. This is definitely hotter than this one though, even though they're the same pigment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, hopefully this is making sense. I would really recommend, you don't have to use this much of it, but I would recommend painting a little swatch of all your colors, making a little chart, use some watercolor paper, something like that. That'll work for everything. You can just so it if you're gonna put your oils on it. Make yourself a color chart that you've got by your easel. Label these so you can go and look on the website. You can look at the light fastness ratings. You can look at what the pigment is and learn about the pigment. If you get them, you pull them out, you're looking at them, do a little bit of color mixing. If it's more this greener kind of yellow, try it with a blue. See what kind of a, a you know green it makes compared to one of these warmer yellows so that when you're mi mixing your color, you're using less paint because you're not having that frustration of, this isn't getting the green I want, what is going on? This is why. When somebody's just saying, these are your primaries, red, yellow, blue, and that's what you mix your secondaries with, they're not telling you that there's different variations of those primaries, okay? Always have a warm yellow and a cool yellow, which means more orangey yellow, more greeny looking yellow, okay? Always have a warm and cool blue. Always have a warm and cool red. I'll say the hardest thing for me, I always got warm and cool reds and yellows. The blue like threw me for a loop every time. Yes. Now this until somebody said that blues, if they're cool, go green. And if they're right. red, they go purple. And then I said, oh. Yep. All right, I'm gonna do the drawdowns of this. Why don't you hit me with any questions and we'll just in between questions i'll say what this is so i think you got most of mine that weren't like we already know we're doing an episode mm -hmm. on that one question i got was could you call if you mixed mars black with a color that you were using would it still be a chromatic black whereas your mars you're if you're at, your if you're adding color. black it's not a chromatic black chroma just means that it's dark where it could pass as a black okay black is black and adding it to another color is what? It's just a shade, okay? Chromatic black means you're taking other colors, a lot of times, complementary colors on the color wheel and mixing it and getting something that looks like black. All right, so this one here real quick, while, while you're getting the next question ready, this is their primary cyan. It's a phthalo-based color, but look, does that look like phthalo to you? Katie, I was really surprised when I looked at the pigment number for it. Really? Uh, yeah. That's PB15, that's Thalo. It's very much not what I expected. We'll no. look at the other Thalos in a minute, but it's lighter. Yeah. Okay, this is our ultramarine blue. You're gonna see that this obviously has a little bit more green in it compared to this. That definitely looks like it's got a little bit more red in it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's very purpley meaning. It doesn't have actual red in it, but the, pig, the pigment itself is a very, very warm blue. All right, any other questions while we're doing this? The next one's just a deep ultramarine, same pigment. You're just gonna see how much deeper that is. Now see, that's warmer still, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a good angle with that, wow. Yeah, I'm trying to get it Isn't so that crazy see. how you can see? Up a little bit yeah, it's that's okay. All right, now we're gonna look at the thalos. And if you've okay, watched right. the show at all, the thalos are the punch you in the face. That's a thalo, but that doesn't perform like it because they've made it lighter in how they've treated the the pigment so that it's a better average mixing blue. Okay. All right, 
This is a phthalo blue-green. It's PB15-3. This is supposed to be that greener look to it. It definitely, you can see, I really kind of screw it on. Look at that, the trans, a little bit of transparency of it looks very similar to that, doesn't it? All right, and now we're going to do the same pigment, but it's the PB15-1, and this is their red shade of it. So hopefully we'll be able to pick it up from the side. To me, that's redder. It may be hard to determine on a monitor. But when you've got that, when something says RS, that means red shade. When something says GS, that means green shade. That means when you've got those blues, you're wanting to get the green shade to mix your greens. You're wanting to get the red shade to mix your violets. Okay, now this one almost looks like black here, doesn't it? That is the Pigment Violet 23. And it's, it says RS, that means it's a red shade. Now, not every manufacturer, oh yeah, that's definitely red, look at that. That one, you, I don't know if you're gonna need to see with the overhead because from the side it looks, oh, you can see it, it's violety. <coughs> the dried, it looks very black. So you can see how that could definitely be used as a chromatic black by itself. If you wanna make it a little more violet, you just give it a tiny pop of white and lighten it just a, a touch. All right, other questions? Do we have other questions, guys? No, okay. All right, so the next show when we go to do this, we're gonna actually start talking about mixing these colors. We're going to talk about values where we're going to learn kind of as we're mixing, how you can lighten and darken things to get you those specific colors. Uh, that app for the Zoom is acting funny. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. We're having some Zoomy problems. Zoomies! Um, but we'll discuss this much further in detail. We will use all of these colors that we've got out when we do the mixing next time, and um, we'll very specifically let you know which colors we're using. We'll also talk about other colors you can use, like yellow ochre, like burnt umber and burnt sienna to actually knock a color down a little bit where you might not think of that. Um, one other thing about, about pigments and mixing, all of these colors that we just showed you in Charbon are all single pigment colors, right? There's only one pigment number that I've written there. Now with student grade colors, if you go to look at your paints at home and you do this little kind of example, which I really urge you to do, the more you know about the color you have, the wiser your color making decisions are going to be and the less paint you're going to waste. Think of it this way. This is a single pigment color. So where's my marker? All right. So with a single pigment color, pigments are ground a specific way per each color where they best reflect the light and give you that color in the best detail where it's not too flat. It's not too grainy perfect thing for each color. A good manufacturer, especially when it's a higher end, when they're talking about professional pigments, maybe if you put the link to that pigment show that we did where we talked about color um, last year. It was last year, wasn't it? It wasn't 2000, or was it 2017? Okay. I don't know. Anyway, we did a whole show based on that and pigment numbers. But something I thought of that would have been helpful is, okay, let's say one of these pigments, this is a single pigment color. Now, it's in a base, which if it's acrylic, obviously this is an acrylic resin, right? This is how you're seeing it. It's the particles here, and it's going to be able to reflect that light really easily from those particles, all right? Can you zoom at all, or is it not doing it? You can do this. Okay. All right. So see, I've got my little pigment particles here. Okay. They're all kind of... Can you, See that? Okay. Oh, yay. Yay. All right. So this is our single pigment. So I'm going to put single pigment. 
obviously they're closer together than this, but I'm just, I'm just showing you. This is because it's the same size and it's the same, you know, same particle size, the same shape, everything else. It's going to reflect that light very dependably for this color. Now, when you get multi-pigment colors, Now, even in professional colors, there will be some ones that they've mixed that it's so that you can just use them straight out of the tube. But this is what you're gonna get with multi-pigment colors. Let's say there's uh, three colors in this. So our little kind of triangles are one thing. Then we've got our dots. And then we've got some squares packed in here too. Now these are random shapes and sizes because each of these pigments that they're using are gonna be a different particle size. They're gonna reflect light differently. So here's our multi-pigment. With this, you're getting the same reflection overall. With this, you've got things going bing bong, 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 all over. Have you ever looked at a paint before and you thought, that color just doesn't have pop. It seems kind of lifeless. It seems kind of dull. Have you guys ever experienced that? Look at that tube of paint and chances are, look for those pigments. You're going to find that there are multiple pigments in that color. And as soon as you go to then make a shade with it or a tint or use this as your mixing blue and you're going to mix it with a yellow that then has two other pigments. So you're putting five pigments together. It's going to look very drab and what's called muddy. How does that make sense? Think of dirt. Dirt's relatively one color. The rain comes, mixes it up into a mud puddle. It just looks like a conglomeration of yuck. It dries, goes back to kind of the regular dirt color, right? Same kind of a concept. All right, we will leave you guys with that. Uh, the next color theory class, I believe, is in March. It's on my calendar. It's already been scheduled out. Yes, Frida. I have one question okay. that I almost forgot. I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, one of the painters on here is colorblind. I was mm -hmm. asking if you had any suggestions. Don't paint in complementary colors because the chances are good that you're not seeing it because you, the red green, that I mean the, the the test for colorblindness. I noticed the last time I went to the eye doctor, uh, somebody asked they're colorblind and they're a painter. What, what do they do? How do they do color theory? Yeah, that's going to be very difficult. Um, depends on how serious your color blindness is. Some people can see a good bit of color and some people like my um, husband's father, it, it's, it's like you just, he needs someone to dress him because it's sad. Um, avoid complementary color schemes because those are going to be harder for you to use unless you're using full strength hues try to paint less in gray values, like graying colors down, because especially if they're complementaries, that's gonna be harder for you to see. Um, find, find a friend or make a friend that's got some good kind of color sense and have them help evaluate what you're doing. Maybe they can suggest switching a yellow out or switching a red out or switching some things out so that you'll be getting more color than maybe what you're really seeing just by kind of their feedback. Um, that's what I would say to do because that's a tough one. You're gonna kind of need some assistance, I would think probably. So I feel for you. Other, th other than that, I mean, you don't wanna have to go to painting in you know, one color in black and white because that's no fun. All right, any other questions? Okay. All right, so we will continue on with the next color theory um, and talk about values and then really get into some color mixing with this. Okay, you guys have a great week.